A Brush With is sponsored by Bloomberg Connects, the arts and culture app. Created by Bloomberg Philanthropies, Bloomberg Connects lets you access museums, galleries and cultural spaces around the world on demand. Download the app to access digital guides and explore a variety of content. Hello, I'm Ben Luke and welcome to A Brush With, the podcast from the art newspaper in which I talk to artists about their influences and the cultural experiences that have shaped their lives and work. And in this episode, it's A Brush With, Stephen Willits, one of the leading figures in conceptual art in Britain who addresses societal issues while exploring the meanings and purposes of art in the real world. Since the 1960s, Stephen's foregrounded ideas that have become somewhat ubiquitous in contemporary art today, including empowering the viewer as a participant, emphasising the role of community in forging his work and collaborating with his subjects so that they're effectively co-authors. From the very start of his career, Willits eschewed what he called the norms and conventions of an object-based art world and instead attempted to subvert what he views as a deterministic culture of objects and monuments. For him, art has a complex, interactive and dynamic social function. Stephen was born in 1943 in London and as we'll hear he did not attend art school as such, initially experiencing art as a teenage gallery assistant and then attending the radical curriculum known as the ground course run by the artist Roy Ascot at Ealing Art School in West London. Inspired by his studies, Stephen identified disciplines beyond art such as theories of learning and communication, early forms of artificial intelligence, advertising theory and cybernetics which has been defined in multiple ways but is linked to communication and control in machine, mechanical or biological systems, including, for instance, the human brain, as core to his work. His earliest pieces were participatory. Organic Exercise from 1962 was what Willits termed an event-based piece, immediately establishing the idea of self-determination that's been constant in his career. Willits arranged plaster blocks of equal size as a square in the middle of a grid and invited the audience to rearrange them, with each person adjusting the work of the last and repeatedly transforming the work. In the mid-1960s, he began making constructions with a spectrum of flashing coloured lights embedded in them, which flashed disconcertingly but according to random computer-generated sequences. Later, he produced light works in which visitors passed through an ultrasonic field created around the constructions, crossing infrared beams and triggering sequences of sound and light. In the mid-1960s, increasingly dissatisfied with the term artist, he branded himself as a conceptual designer. He began the production of designs for clothing and bags which were distributed to boutiques in London and sold successfully, and he produced an influential magazine, Control, which continues today. And while he returned to call himself an artist later, that questioning of an artist's role is fundamental to his practice. Stephen had a growing conviction of art's social function and his work of the 1970s engaged profoundly with notions of community and social interaction. He founded the Centre for Behavioural Art in London and from there initiated the West London Social Resource Project. His war works of the 1970s again included participatory elements like response sheets. Stephen would present problems phrased as questions, necessitating his viewers' direct involvement in realising the work. The question he said, were not primarily to communicate information to another person, but to register the effect which answering has on the respondent. He also published a book at this time, Art and Social Function. The wall works were presented as models, often based on his studies of cybernetics or homeostasis, the study of self-regulatory processes, and would involve multiple parts. They were often diagrammatic in form, involving photographic imagery and text. In this period, he became particularly interested in social environments like tower blocks and the wastelands around them, participants in their actual environments along with recordings of their observations initially done through audio interviews and converted into text. He hoped that in these works visitors could reach into the experience of isolation in the tower blocks and view aspects of their own cultural situation by viewing someone else's. Variations of this approach have continued in his work today with two works on show at the Victoria Miro Gallery in London in the winter of 2023 inviting individuals to model their subjective states in relation to their experience of time and place. Stevens continued to make profound found explorations of community ever since the 1970s and in the early 80s he became interested in the people that went to clubs in London like the Cha Cha Club in his work Cha 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 of 1982. He was intrigued by the way that these countercultural spaces were places where individuals came together to express non-normative behaviours amid like-minded people. 
And he continued to subvert the way that galleries might exist, apparently separately from their local environments. His 1999 South London Gallery show, Changing Everything, captured the experiences of local residents from the North Peckham estate as they recorded journeys through the estate, capturing the reality of people's experiences of social issues in the gallery space. Perhaps the most dramatic form of these analyses of social environments were the data stream works of 2011 and 2012, which he called Portraits of New York and London. In them, he captured two markedly different streets in the two cities, Regent Street in the centre of London and Rye Lane in Peckham, and Fifth Avenue and Delancey Street, different worlds within Manhattan. He captured these areas via a series of ten channels of information, from facial expressions to signs of nature and the fabric of the environment, and organised the information in a zigzagging gridded structure through the gallery, a dynamic and diagrammatic portrait of two great cities and their people. Stephen sees reality as something we construct, something that can be viewed from multiple changing perspectives. His art is an open work based on agreement and open agreement, he says. And it's this with which I began our conversation. He's had this conviction about reforming the very idea of art from the start. Why? Well, for a start, I didn't um, graduate from anywhere, not at all. I mean, I come from a completely different background from most artists. I sort of found myself in the late um, 1950s through some sort of miracle event, working in a very avant-garde art gallery in London, which was completely tangential to most of things that were going on. It wasn't really focused on the British tradition of St. Ives and Bomberg and the art of the late 40s, early 50s, but was looking at Europe and, to a certain extent, America. It was a kind of um, event in a lifetime, really, to find myself there. I was only 15, and uh, it was showing artists which were seminal to the development of uh, European art and the foundation of what happened in the late 60s, early 70s. And, yeah, we had great artists, but it was completely ignored almost by the English. It was run by a Polish lady who came to Europe to dis- sort of escape the communists, also the Germans beforehand. And uh, she found herself over here and uh, had the idea that uh, English society would be more liberal than that in Paris, of which she was, I think, greatly mistaken. But nevertheless, she that's what she felt. And she set up this little gallery. The only people that seemed to visit were artists. So we had artists coming from all over the place. And I met these artists. I was only the gallery assistant. There was just me and my boss, you know. So consequently, I got to talk to really good artists and uh, conversations I had with them became important. But also at that time, I was looking at the development of new thinking in terms of philosophy. And then more importantly, still in a way, I was looking at the developments in new languages, ways of describing reality and ways of dealing with reality. And in this respect, I came across the origins of artificial intelligence, 1958. And my father, who was a librarian, managed to get hold of for me of these set of symposium papers called the Mechanization of Thought Process. Well, this was a world-shattering event that the National Physical Laboratory in London put on courtesy of the uh, government sponsorship and they invited all the great thinkers in the world dealing with this early cybernetics, second order cybernetics and the uh, idea of the information processing and uh, different ways of thinking about social networks and so on to London to this symposium. It was a colossal event. Everybody was there and the papers that uh, were presented shaped the future interest of technologies and philosophy in this area ever since. So I was particularly interested in Minsky and McCluck and Selfridge and uh, Ross Ashby. Ross Ashby became important to me because he dealt with the idea of self-organizing systems. It was interesting because there was a recognition of the idea that the world was complex So this in itself was a sort of uh, a rejection of um, last century thinking, uh, object-based thinking from the Victorian period. When you say, for instance, look at a radio, it just talks to you. You can't be in a dialogue with it. 
and it reflected the idea of the receiver as object. And object-based thinking tends to be reductive and simple in a way. It denies the complexity of the other. I could go on and on, but I, <laughs> there's various reasons for this, but it has certain ramifications to the sort of culture you're living in. But it also is reflective of the idea of competitive systems. And here were people thinking about other sorts of models of society, which were based on mutuality, the idea of complexity, interaction, and self-organization, that the, there was no hierarchy. It wasn't a sort of deterministic structure. It was organic. But unfortunately, the engineering was way behind the ideas of that time, the sort of models that were coming out. So this led to a very reductive engineering solution. So two solutions came out. One was the idea of black box, which was the idea of lessening the level of resolution to a system to the point where it could be replicated graphically as a sort of box and maybe with some arrows and all the rest of it. And different gates could be reproduced. So you had this sort of modeling and it became a way of looking at uh, systems, networks between people and so on in motion. That's the point. It wasn't like a picture anymore. A picture, it was a static representation of a structure of some sort, but um, a simulation is the idea of something in movement. So we're now talking about moving systems and so on. So I was very interested in all this, and it seemed to be like an opening up to a new vision of society. So it's sort of fundamental in a way that the person that originates a language determines the vision. So when you, for instance, get onto your computer and you you know, you're, you've actually been given a, a way of looking at the world through the organization of the language of that computer. But that doesn't mean to say that that's how it is at all, and that there are very different ways of looking at things. So at the point of the early 1960s, people were thinking about feed-forward heuristic systems, but essentially they were linear, and they might be branching and all the rest of it. But I was interested in something completely different. And what I was interested in was the idea of omnidirectional systems. And it's only recently that the engineering has been able to sort of replicate these sort of ideas. And, you know, things have started to move rather rapidly. Yeah, so I was really interested in these sort of philosophical models and the way the brain organized information and built metalanguages between different parts of the brain and all the rest of it. And that was in the zeitgeist of the moment. And though much of our practice itself at that time was very traditional, based in the gallery, on the wall, with a viewer as object, <laughs> object-based viewer. But one of the things was that uh, when I was in the gallery, we didn't have many visitors. And um, I was sort of left in there for long periods to try to uh, make somebody welcome if they ever turned up. And uh, while I was there, I started reading and making models myself. And I thought, well, I'm in an environment here where people are really looking for objects of certainty, that the artwork is emulative, you know, it presents an ideal type. You know, I began to think about it, and I suddenly realized that really the most important thing about a work of art was the audience. Without the audience, the work didn't exist. And of course, at that time, Wittgenstein was a sort of really a new philosopher, as it were, people were being introduced to him. Of course, now, these days, everybody knows Tractatus Philosophicus, but that time, it was really new, and it seemed quite radical. But one of, one of the things he talks about, of course, is the oneness of things can't exist. And these seem to be fundamental cultural ideas, that, one, the world we live in was complex, it was multi-channel, it existed on different levels of resolution simultaneously, it was random, and the brain itself was really a social phenomena. So... We're sitting here now, but there's three brains here, and we're all in a network, whether we like it or not. <laughs> and we're acting on each other. These sort of ideas, seeing, you know, I was only 15 at the time, revolutionary, you <laughs> know, and uh, exciting. And it kind of came about at a moment when there was uh, a sort of uh, rebellion against the straitjacket of the 1950s. The 1950s were very inhibitory. And also, I mean, you know, very illiberal. So, I mean, if you were homosexual, you could go to jail. Anarchist, you'd be pestered by the special branch or something. <laughs> you know, it was a very, very normative kind of world, which incidentally we seem to be going back to. But mm -hmm. anyway, at that point, it seriously was. And this younger generation rebelled against it. And not just in the visual arts, but in theatre, music, 
and architecture and one thing and another. I'm sure you know all about that. Yeah. But for me, it was very exciting. And one of the things that came out of it was the idea of hierarchies and special knowledge is that it represents a sort of power in a way within a certain structure. Even in those days, I was thinking about the world as language islands and these islands being the preserve of different groups of people. And you had the idea of the specialist and all this sort of thing. But that began to break down and people began to think that there should be kind of networks between different groups of people that normally would not be in contact with each other. You know, so for instance, uh, if you think of where a hospital is organised, you know, you have these specialists in different domains. But what about if there was a free flow of information and interaction between these different domains? And uh, that's what started to happen culturally. You know, for instance, this place in the early 60s was full of all sorts of people. And... Um, you mean London? This studio. Oh, this studio, right. <laughs> yeah, it was full of all sorts of people. Uh-huh. Scientists, psychologists, musicians, poets, all kinds of people. And the, the general mood was that maybe there was nothing so special about being an artist because other people were creative too, you know, and that led ultimately to be calling myself a conceptual designer for right. about nine months. <laughs> but the, uh, you talk about, you know, how did you start? Well, actually, I was a share transfer clerk and, in Grafton Street and it was a very boring job. And in the lunch hour, I used to go up and down the Bond Street. And I remember one day I saw a, a picture in the window of uh, a gallery, Wildenstein's, I think it was. And it was uh, a Monet. And in a flash, I said, well, that's it. I'm going to be an artist. That was it. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. But the thing was that I was in this very boring job. And I realized that the only way I could do what I wanted to do, it was like a sort of insight, realization, was to leave this boring job. So at the end of the lunch hour, I walked back into the office and there was a bit like diggings. There were sort of big benches with huge ledgers on and people on stools bent over these ledgers, writing these share transfers. And at the end, there was a man who overseed the whole thing. You know, I was only a junior, but I walked through this office to where this man who was overseeing the whole thing. And uh, he asked me what I wanted. And I said, I want to leave. And he said, what do you want to leave for? I said, you've only just come here. So I said, well, I want to be an artist. And he nearly fell off his stool. You know, everybody <laughs> listened in the whole place. And uh, I said, well, you know, I've decided this is what I want to do. And he said, well, why don't you go and see establishments? So I said, well, if I go to establishments, I'll never leave. You know, we go three months notice. You know. <laughs> this is just something I had to do. So it turned out that fortunately for me, he was a sort of amateur artist. And he told me I was a fool to think I should be able to just go and be an artist that I should perhaps carry on with my work there and perhaps go to evening classes like he did apparently he was an amateur right. artist you see. so that sort of helped and then I said no I can't do that I've got to go and I walked out a free person and as I did the whole place erupted into clapping because <laughs> <laughs> these poor people have been sat on that stool for years and you're an emblem of freedom. yeah into the freedom so I walked out into Grafton Street and then I suddenly realised in a panic that I had to go back to my mother and I hadn't actually got this job, you know, anymore. <laughs> so I went to the Medici Society and asked if they'd take me on and I'd never heard of any of the artists they mentioned. And uh, so they didn't really want me. They said, well, you know, you don't really know enough. So I went up all the galleries in Bond Street asking if they would take me on as an assistant. And some were nice to me and some weren't nice to me. But eventually I came to a gallery uh, in South Moulton Street and a very established gallery and I got talking to someone in the office there and he said to me well there's a very old family firm and they didn't have any vacancies but they knew of this new gallery that was sitting up in and uh, they'd asked if they could recommend anybody to work in the gallery so he rang him up and he said oh you know we've known this man you've known him for years very old friend of the family and I just met him five minutes ago <laughs> but, you know. so I walked over to the gallery and there was my boss and she sort of welcomed me in I was fortunate I looked much older than I was and there we are I changed the rest from, is history the rest is history so in the afternoon I was now a gallery assistant at this very avant-garde edgy place you talked about the role of the spectator the role of the viewer mm. and empowering them somehow there's a really really nice quote from you which was about how you were basically creating a situation in which they could remodel social reality 
with you effectively as a participant with you, a collaborator. And you said you knew right from the start, basically, that, that you wanted to involve the audience. Well, I thought it was essential and it also pointed to a different kind of society. I mean, the, the audience was always important. I mean, it was always there. Art practice is a social experience, whether you like it or not. And um, you're just kidding yourself if you think you're independent of society that you're living in. So it's sort of a matter of uh, <laughs> dealing with the parameters of the situation. But it was a sort of uh, really important um, insight that pointed towards, you know, the kind of society that we all thought we were going to be moving into during the 60s, you know. Yeah. This led to me making a series of constructions which presented the viewer with a set of variables which they could change and put into different configurations. But they recorded these changes on a sort of response sheet. And there was a little gallery called Gallery One, I was long since gone, unfortunately. But um, he was going to make an exhibition um, of these manual variables, they were called. The idea of somebody externalising their implicit and reordering implicit representations in their, in, their, <laughs> in their frame of reference was so that it kind of fed back to them. You know, they externalised it, they made a diagram or selected a variable. But then it was left for other people. So that introduced you to, to the relativity of your own perception, hmm. the idea that there is no universality to perception whatsoever, and it's, um, it's you that's creating reality in your own head. There's no getting around it. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And you would directly, for instance, in projects that you made in the 70s and indeed before, you would go on long research projects, you'd record them on tape recorders, you would take photographs of them and so on, so that their involvement was absolutely at the heart of the making of the work. Well, yes, it's perhaps worth noting that from, oh, I don't know, 69 through to about 73, there was no artist, Stephen Willett, didn't exist. So that the works were self-organising and they involved groups of people. So the authorship of the work was dispersed within the idea of it. Yeah, I was interested in the idea that a work of art should have what it means to people that was important and their sort of ability to be able to cognise a meaning within it that is relevant to them. So you're dealing with meaning and relevance. To that end, I later on started to look at polemics in society that would be meaningful to people. So the works were driven by the interrelationship between the audience and the reality represented within the work and um, questions or problem situations, as we called them, which would involve you in making lateral connections, different connections within it. So there's a lot of very complex ideas, but they're all in this world of thinking that was going on at the time, which was where you were looking outside the historical models of art to models of communication. I mean, first I was looking at advertising theory, especially time-based advertising. In 1965, I went to the practitioners and advertising's library and got hold of their research papers, looking at time-based models of communication. Well, that was pretty revolutionary, actually, at the time, especially as they were multi-channel, so you were marrying up the idea of fragmenting a an idea into parts and these parts being introduced at different points in time using different media channels, maybe a newspaper, maybe audio broadcast, for instance. Mm. The um, first interactive broadcast work was part of the cognition control project, which we did up in Nottingham in 1971, called Mass Media People, mm. made with Radio Nottingham. And, you know, so we were exploring all channels. Well, it was exciting, but it put you at odds with the established art world to some extent. But we also had the idea that, you know, there's no reason to go back. You could go back to a kind of zero. You could look at the meaning of art, the role of the artist, the functionality of art, and come up with modus operandi which would maximise the transformational possibilities for the audience. So if you think in most art in society... It projects existing norms and values. 90%, I don't know what particular percent, but really most of art is concerned with presenting you with emulative stereotypes. In fact, I think most of art, in a way, is inhibitory to the creative potential of the viewer. But there is another idea about art practice, which is much harder and 
fewer artists are concerned with it, it seems, and that is where the artist looks for a new language, presents the viewer with a new language, which transforms the way they see the world around them, but not in a descriptive way, but in a transformative way. So you see that one thing can be another thing, you know. I always thought that that act of transformation was the creative act from one thing into another. Absolutely. You stick into a tool or something like that. There's a very simplistic way of thinking. But so you've got this interrelationship between context, the place in which the work is presented, the language, the frame of reference of the audience. You know, these are all important variables. Yeah, indeed. I wanted to talk about the materiality of the work because even today you're using Letraset, you're using ink, and there's a lovely tactility about the work, and that has always been there. And it's interesting when you're making work in the field of models and systems and so on, that there is that sort of handmade element to it. And it seems to me that's crucial in the way that the work has been delivered over the years. Well, I think that's a misnomer. You've got that completely wrong. <laughs> Sorry, uh, you may not realise the full breadth of what's going on. So I had the idea that every channel should be available to the artist, that the artist shouldn't limit themselves to a particular way of operating. Mm -hmm. They become a craftsperson, you know, a painting. Limit yourself to say, this is the way I operate. That was a very much a very 50s idea was that media dexterity led to a kind of a idea about the function and the modus operandi. So if you look at Harry Thubron and uh, the post Bauhaus uh, educational practices, you know, the Mahalina, Chicago Institute and so on, mm -hmm. they were looking at the idea of students uh, going through media handling you know they went through the whole process about I mean, uh, but really what was important was that what do they do with all this but there was interesting this idea that came from ealing school of art was roy ascot mm. in the early 60s was that theory should precede practice so you kind of know what you want to do and then you find a way to do it yeah do you see it's a kind of different way of operating so therefore i always um Felt so I was making clothing work, simulation work in the 60s, working with computer programming, you know, different technologies. It was always really what, as it were, worked best for what you wanted to say and how you wanted to say it. So I see no reason not to use a pencil or, for that matter, make a mark on a bit of rock. Right. You know, I mean, it's just what works. Yeah. Yeah, so you have to evaluate it like that. As soon as you fetishize the process... You've had it, you know, you're in a craft situation. Let's move on to the questions that we ask all our guests. Oh, OK. I know who the first artist whose work you loved was because it was Monet, as you say, you, as you saw through well, that, that window. No, no, not subsequently, but that was a realisation at the time. Yes. Did you follow up on that immediately in terms of looking into Monet's uh, no, broader... No, 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 no. I was always an artist. Right. I always think that the artist has their own story. You know, it's no point emulating somebody else. When I was in the gallery, people used to come around artists with works. I mean, it's the 1950s. Everything was very simple then. And quite in a way compared in a way. to now. Yeah, yeah, in sort of informal. So artists would sort of come in with, you know, a sort of pat on the back, you know, a whole load of canvases, and they would put them around the gallery for people to have a look at with the idea that they might get an exhibition or join the gallery in some way or just get a critique. Well, my boss was um, no holes barred. She wouldn't mess around. You know, she would say, well, you know, this has got a bit of Picasso in or a bit of this in or a bit of that. And she said, well, you know, this is no good. You've got to really start again and... Um, create your own language, create your own story. Don't look at somebody else. Uh, look at the context you're in and so on. But learn from other people, but don't emulate them. Absolutely. So I thought that was where I've been at ever since. <laughs> right. And in terms of, you know, looking at historic artists today, mm. which artists have you learned from in recent years? Well, none really. I mean, I, I look at it in a totally different way. I mean, uh, I mean uh, involved in this business every moment of every day since about 1958. So I kind of look at artists and the art world in, in a quite a different way. I, I noticed one of the questions you had was about the museum. And I thought, well, 
I see the museum in totally differently. I'm, and I'm not a visitor. You know, I'm a practitioner and the museum is part of my work. You know, it's, it's a context in which the work can um, exist or it can be a kind of interface between the world outside and the world in the head sort of thing. I don't know. But it's, um, it's something I use. Yeah. And try and transform. So a lot of work I made, you know, was directly connected with the role of the art museum in society and how to create a kind of uh, interactive interface or use the museum as a tool yeah. by the community. Yeah. Instead of something that you go into some sort of language shrine and have to learn all these special languages and <laughs> historical references and all the rest of it, you know, that it should really connect to the world that people live in. While we're talking about museums, I, I wanted to ask you about the Time Tumblr project, that unrealised project that you embarked on at the British Museum, which is nonetheless pretty hugely influential. Well, yeah, apparently it's still going on. Ah, great. <laughs> the feedback I had recently. <laughs> yes, the idea really was that uh, part of this idea that the world inside the museum has got seriously out of sync with the world around it, you see. For instance, I was up in Manchester at the Manchester City Art Gallery in you know, 1830. Mm. And the interior world of this museum is seriously out of sync with the world around it. However, when I have uh, conversations with curators about ways in which to create a kind of dynamic relationship between that world and the world inside the museum becomes fluidly connected to the world around it, curators tend to kind of shrink away from this idea. Funny enough, the BM is one institution that's very forward-thinking and looking at these sort of ideas. And the idea really was that it was sort of in this Egyptian department, you know, they, they have seriously old objects locked away, buried away there, and, and perhaps nobody sees them for decades upon decades. So the idea was to connect these fragments, if you like, into the world around the museum so that people could see them as part of their life, how they might connect to their lives. And we were going to develop a, a simulation program and there were these drawings there in the exhibition, which were sort of models that came out of this research. And the basic idea was, of course, that time doesn't exist. It's a cultural and human construction. Events take place, but time as such doesn't exist. And uh, it's a relatively recent cultural phenomenon. And something which has been commandeered by various sort of imperial states, for instance, to their advantage and so on. Well, maybe, I don't know, but I, I, I'm not going to comment about it in that way. But I'm just saying, if you think time doesn't exist, then this object is no longer old, Yeah, you see. So we may give it a history, but it doesn't have a history itself. In fact, it doesn't really care, I don't think. It doesn't think about you too much. So, it, <laughs> you know, you have to think that the, the world around you doesn't care a damn about you. Uh, so it's us that's creating all these relationships within our society as an I see society as an extension of the brain, sort of neural networks. And also, whilst we're on the subject of museums, it's notable that there's a picture of Tate Britain and the National Gallery in one of the recent works, oh, which yeah, is called The right. Reconnection. That was the idea of the language island. Well, the thing was that I, that was a work made in lockdown, you know, the COVID period. And um, one of the uh, <laughs> things about the COVID period was that you were allowed out for an hour a day. Well, fortunately, I live in the centre of London, so, you know, you could walk around. And if you went to Mayfair or something, there was no one there. No cars, no people, no nothing. Just you. It's like some sort of strange movie. And uh, this was the work that came up from there. So I was able to make these photographs without any people in them, as long as I did it within an hour, you know. Yeah. Yeah, you had to be there and back. <laughs> <laughs> but it's interesting that in that image, you also see photographs of tower blocks. So it's one of these models. It's called the reconnection. So there's all sorts of associations one can make in terms of, as you say, like sort of reconnecting with the city or, and so on. Tell me more about how that system works. Well, I'm, I'm struck by the fact that all these institutions, you know, have their own language in a way, which is special to them. And in order to access those institutions, you have to acquire pre-knowledge of these references and, uh, you know, what it refers to, these languages, and be able to articulate them. So this is not only true of cultural institutions, but business institutions and medical institutions and so on. So what I'm proposing is a sort of what I call the data flow, is a sort of meta flow between institutions so that this information is not the preserve of any one place, but is available within a one-layer network. 
So this is why I was always interested in the idea of the homeostat stack and the one layer network, decision making network. So within a one layer network, all nodes are connected to all other nodes. This means that, uh, say, for instance, if one node was loaded with a one, the baseline would reset to a one because every other node within the network would have access to it. This is sort of model I was interested in the idea of mutual systems. You know, the great cultural developments of the, <laughs> in the last 40 years is the recognition that the world is not simple, but complex. And that in complexity, there are more variables. And within more variables, there's a richness available for possibilities. So when I was developing a work like you saw upstairs in the Victoria Mirror Gallery, you know, I was creating works which were like, um, you could almost see them as a computer program on a wall, really. They're symbolic realms with references, which were the question that asks you to connect things together. But of course, everybody will connect different things and sit in a different way. And so therefore, in a way, you're building your own picture of not what's there, but what's yeah. up here. In your brain, in, in, your, in, in, your, in, your, in your preconceptions. preconceptions and, yeah. and your, yes, your, your, yeah. Your, yeah. your learned behaviours, your biases and yeah. so on. Yeah. And those questions are somehow polemical. So they were of that moment. And there are more recent works, the work I made about the invisibility of old age and the process of reorientation in migration. So somebody coming from one part of the world to another world. Yeah, so they are, again, very polemical works for the moment, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And again, they sort of came out of that COVID period. So that seems to be, so that sort of definitely was a moment where you had a sort of a stillness, a kind of peace where you could think clearly, you know, and develop ideas. Hmm. A Brush With is sponsored by Bloomberg Connects, the arts and culture app. The free app offers access to more than 300 cultural organisations through a single download, with new guides being added regularly. Among the most recent additions to the app are the Mac Centre for Art and Architecture in Los Angeles and the Atkinson in Liverpool, UK. Among the guides on Bloomberg Connects are several UK museums where Stephen Willits has shown his work, from Tate to the Whitechapel Gallery and the South London Gallery. If you download the guide to the South London Gallery, you'll find a feature on its current exhibition, the work of the legendary US artist. Pope L, as well as past shows and an archival section looking at the two buildings that form the gallery, the original Victorian space opened in 1891 and the old fire station across the road that opened to the public in 2018. To explore digital guides to all the partnering institutions, download the app today. It's available from the App Store and Google Play and you can keep up to date by following Bloomberg Connects on Facebook, X formerly known as Twitter and Instagram. At this point, I normally ask what you have pinned to the studio wall. We're sitting in your studio. But the thing that I wanted to talk about most, and it's very evident when you're here, is the clocks, the collection of clocks. You talked about time earlier on, but why do you collect clocks? And what? Well, I don't really it? collect them. I just acquired them. <laughs> well, as I said, time doesn't really exist. And it's a sort of mechanical device. I'm always interested in, I don't know, mechanical things, electronics and things like that. I particularly like objects that have more than one function. Remember the idea of democratic objects. For instance, tea's made. I don't have one of these things. I don't <laughs> like them much. But Or like this clock here tells you the, the time, the date, you know, and the month and it's so on. It's a kind of very modernist idea of a clock, that, isn't it? It's got that beautiful modernist font, this, the sans serif font, giving us the date, the time and the day. Yeah, it's a famous clock. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but I renovated it. On the end there, you'll see it's got a, a mechanism that's uh, accurate to a nanosecond. That's cut by hand. Oh, nice. And in terms of the other things you have around, obviously you have some of your own works. Do you have things around you that, that you like to have to prompt thinking, to prompt making and so on? Well, maybe. I mean, they're not really. I mean, they're just, um, just here. I mean, I don't really think about it. I noticed that when I was in Berlin in the late 70s, I was working with people up in modern housing complexes mm. around Berlin the Mirkisches Viertel and Gropiostadt and Neukölln and places. And um, I sort of noticed that people had sort of modern objects in their apartments and it was important for them to feel modern. This is a sort of feeling that seems to have disappeared. They had these objects which gave them an idea of the future. It was a future that was implicit in this object, but the objects had been manufactured by somebody else and designed by somebody else, but they'd take it into their environment. And a lot of these objects were sort of on the periphery. 
they weren't sort of central focus. Maybe they might be above the television or something, but they tended to be around the edge. And there would be other objects that maybe reminded them of their family past or something like that. But the emphasis was definitely on being modern. And these were the vehicles, you know, that gave them that idea. And then I noticed that a lot of them had vases and things around. And I thought, well, it's interesting, these, these modern vases, because they're also very monumental. Like the building they were living in was very monumental, almost like a huge sculpture. But it was sort of object-based in the sense that the people in it were just inhabitants. They couldn't determine anything really about the fundamental nature of the environment they were inside, except that they could create this sort of counter-consciousness. For instance, the window was very important. You know, the world outside became object-based through the picture window and that. Mm. And uh, people projected themselves through the window to create connections with that world. Yes, so I got interested in these vases, you know, and the monumentality of them. I did start to collect them, which I then used in various still life works to make a relationship between architecture and the domestic object here. And there's a work, for instance, called Our Interpersonal Home, which, which features clocks, indeed, from 1990. Yeah. And in that sense, it's very clear that you are making connections between the building, the person, the objects that they have around them. And again, you're inviting the audience to bring their own assumptions or bring their own ideas yeah. and, yes, be part of that moving system. Yes, well, that's correct. But the idea is that, you see, fundamentally, instead of an artwork being a sort of fetishistic object, I have the idea that it's a tool and the outcome of the work, you know, is the cognitive transformations and realisations that exist in the viewer or the audience or the participant and perhaps in the artist. You know, like when we made these projects, there was a sort of dialogue between the audience and the artist or the people that were driving the project forward that was in a kind of basic on a sort of feedback loop. So what happened determined what might happen and so on. This is quite different from the idea of a work which you stand in awe of and gawp at. And I saw most museums being cluttered up with this work when in fact they could operate in a much more connected way with the world around them. And indeed, uh, mm. very many museums have now, many years later, taken on some of those ideas. Yeah, well, there was sort of 68, there were these sort of cybernetic models made by scientists, not by artists, where they recreated the idea of the museum. There's a, a, a very interesting book called The Cybernetics of Everyday Affairs, mm. written by somebody called Fred Bill. And he even sort of remodeled the game of cricket around <laughs> as a cybernetic model of interaction and feedback and so on. And then it, they took certain things, and one of them was the, the art gallery. And I remember this had a big effect on me reading this. And when I came to do the exhibition at the Museum of Modern Art, as it was called then in Oxford in 1968, I had the idea that I should do something to actually use the museum itself as part of the experience. So instead of being a container, you know, it became a vehicle. So we created this kind of maze in which the work would be presented and you sort of came across it. It was quite primitive, but we're looking at intentions here, you know. Yeah. And this when it was sort of plunged into darkness as well. There were sort of elements where, where yeah, yeah, that's yeah, it. That you came would use light as a kind of... Yeah. Random variable works. Yeah. But they weren't like in a room, but you encountered them that's in great. this maze, yeah. Which cultural experience changed the way you see the world? Well, I don't know. I can't say. It's always evolving. I mean, I'm always... Thinking, uh, I think walking down the street is probably it. Sometimes I like to get out of bed in the morning and you have to get into kind of a Zen mode and you just walk down the street and you just let it all come in. You're not thinking about, you know, where you're going or your bank balance or anything like that. You're just allowing the sensation of moving through reality to come in. And to me, that is a cultural experience. But in a way, it becomes a sort of, in yourself, a kind of celebration of being, you know. Is it simple enough to say sometimes as you're walking down the street, ideas for works can come to you as a result of the hundreds of interactions and yeah, many experiences? Yeah, what I call the R factor. Suddenly you say, ah! Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you have a sort of insight. But also I think my life, I mean, I think is you know, it's like a series of miracles and you've got to be able to optimise the miracle. So I've evolved my work. You know, it's not static. 
it wasn't locked into constructivist type of manual variable constructions in the early 60s or simulation work in the late 60s and you know the projects of the 70s everything's always moving on absolutely and you know whether it's making furniture or clothing or making a drawing or you know whatever it's all geared towards thinking about uh, the uh, intervention of the artist in society you know yeah you're intervening you're causing changes of vision so in a way, the artist introduces the viewer to a new vision and uh, they can internalise that vision according to their own frame of reference and it becomes much more meaningful as a result. So instead of you emulating some other artist and learning their language and, and kind of, uh, uh, I don't know, being sort of awestruck, that doesn't do anything for you. In fact, it sort of somehow belittles your own potential. Which writers or poets do you return to? I mean, the important person, I guess, is Heinz von Forster when he mm. developed the idea of second-order cybernetics. So initially, cybernetics was connected to very mechanistic kind of clunky thinking. But then it was introduced to the idea of fluidity and a different way of thinking about it altogether. And I think that that notion of the strange attractor and all this sort of thing has shaped a lot of contemporary thinking. Well, it had not until recently... It seems to be going back towards a more mechanistic moment, I think, in time. Right. Yeah. Is that part of the digital age? Is that part of the... No, I think it's a social political situation right. we're in. Yeah. 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 And Van Furster is connected to chaos theory, is that right? And, and so, therefore, is chaos theory a, a particular area of interest for you or is it particular... Well, it, chaos theory is a misnomer, isn't it? I mean, chaos, there can be no theory of chaos. <laughs> <laughs> chaos is chaos. And uh, right. you know it when you come across it. What music or other audio do you listen to while you're working? Oh, I don't listen to any music. No, I have to have a sort of zen-like head, you know. But I used to be very much involved in music, yeah, yeah. very long time ago. But. There's a period in particular where you were very interested in punk and its social implications. So That's true, yeah. yeah. I was interested in DIY, the idea of people being able to create their own culture. And I noticed when I was working out in West London that uh, music had become unobtainable almost. You know, I had to have a great big studio contract and orchestra and a lot of money to produce something. But people reacted against that. And it was almost like a sort of late 50s thing of being able to do something yourself in your garage or your back room and so on. That was accompanied by dress codes and people made magazines and things, fanzines. And basically people were creating a new language, which was in a way resistance to the drive towards a sort of an authoritative normality that was sort of uh, being imposed at that time. It was a sort of an expression of, self-organization of self-identity of something so well i i'm here i'm existing i have something to say you know and i mean i went to rough trade every saturday and bought a copy of every single diy record that had come in that week so i've got cabinets full of them. right it's effectively when the independent labels really came into their own and started producing some of the greatest music in british history and there's a whole network which was absolutely based around art schools as well at that time. So there was a fantastic nexus of music and art and so on at that moment. Yeah, there has been always. I mean, the idea of music and rebellion, the idea of breaking norms. But a lot of the music was very emulative. So like the music I was involved in, when I think back at it, was really, yeah, it was uh, retro, really. Yeah, I think the Stones were retro. And, <laughs> you know, Long John Baldry and, yeah. you know, all those people. I used to be at the Ealing Club, play at the Ealing Club. Oh, yeah. Il Pie Island and Il Core Daddy Club. But um, at the time, he thought it was revolutionary. But looking back at it, I could see connections with uh, American blues recordings and, you know, rhythm and blues of the late 1940s and all that sort of thing. 
Right, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I wanted to explore the word cha-cha-cha, which seems to me to be directly connected to that. But this, this is where you were basically founding areas of counterculture and seeing how they were intersecting with that sort of normative culture. And it seems to me that was a really crucial moment as well, that there were these amazing creative spaces that people could attend that were in some way set aside from the rest of society. Well, people have always done that. I mean, I was working in Berlin, developing works which were centred on how people had created their own counter-consciousness about the consciousness being layered onto them. I mean, you know, Berlin was a sort of symbol of Western culture at that time in, you know, a socialist world, as it were. But people living in Berlin was also trying to maintain their own value structures. They had their own cultures, like the Schlebergard and all this sort of thing. Hmm. So people had created their own kind of island, you know, in which they could feel free to be the person they wanted to be, to exist as themselves. And um, when I came back to London, I worked in the wastelands in West London Mm. with glue sniffers and people who created their own context outside society. There's one called the Lurky Place. That's that's a famous one, yeah. But there are others as well. These were areas that had just been left and um, people went in there to do things they couldn't do in society. But I quite often went in groups, so it was a sort of social phenomenon. And I was working like that, and one day I I was walking down the Edgware Road, and I saw an ex-student of mine who um, who was walking down, he was really white-faced and looked very disheveled. And I said, oh, hello, Kevin, are you all right? And he said, oh, how's... And uh, he said, yeah, I've just been to this club, you know, and it's an amazing club. And I said, oh, what's that? Oh, it's called the Cha-Cha Club. And then he told me about this club, and I thought, wow, that's it, because... It was a club, people were trying to create an environment where they could just externalise their own values. So I went to the church, I managed to get in. I mean, I managed to talk to the people that ran it about the idea of making this work, uh, that was uh, looking at, you know, the way they developed their own own languages. But it was a sort of really the zeitgeist at that moment that was really there. I mean, to get to it was difficult. They were very selective about who went in and so on. And, of course, there were some fabulous people in there. (laughs) And uh, I made this work, are you good enough to cha-cha-cha? Because that was their entrance code, are you good enough to get in? But once you're in, you're really in. And uh, so that's how I met Lee Bowie and, well, all sorts of other people there. Boy, George was there, a whole host of people. When I was working there, I began to realise that there were all these other places that had been set up. And each one reflected a different kind of orientation of the people that went there. And some of them really were radical. There was a place called the um, Model Dwellings, which was where people even developed dress codes and language codes. They even spoke in a funny way. They had their own dance codes. And it seems funny now, but at the time it seemed like really, really like the future. And then there was the Anarchy Centres, this uh, Mohicans, and you know different groups of people. But essentially they were all externalizing themselves with in a group and they developed languages which were languages of rejection so the idea was to keep people out that's the origin of punk really was yeah. to be so obnoxious that they wouldn't bother you anymore you see you get on with your own life you know and it was a big moment because if you think about it people could suddenly were felt free to be that person they were they didn't have to hide their sexuality or the way they behave really It came out onto the street. As I said, previously, 20 years earlier, people were frightened to talk about certain things because they were frightened of the consequences. And they lived in secret societies. But suddenly, there was no secret society. People were proud to be who they were, you know. Is there a particular discipline in your daily working life that you see as an essential ritual? Well, I'm not at the moment. I mean, I used to, when I was a conceptual designer, I used to put on a white coat at nine o'clock in the morning and then take it off at six o'clock. And then while I had the coat on, I was this conceptual designer, you see. So that was definitely a ritual. If you could live with just one work of art, what would it be? Oh, I wouldn't live with one work of art at all. No, I just need the tools to create a work of art. I wouldn't want to live with someone else's particularly. And lastly, what's art for? As I said earlier on... um, Most art celebrates the norms and values of the world as it is. But there is another motivation in art, is to change those norms and values into the world as it could be. 
So I'm strongly associated with the world as it could be rather than the world as it is. Stephen, thank you so much. Thank you very much, yes. Stephen Willett's Time Tumbler is at Victoria Mirror Gallery in London until the 13th of January 2024. And that's it for this episode. Please subscribe to A Brush With wherever you're listening and do give us a rating or review on Apple Podcasts. Do also subscribe to our sister podcast, The Week in Art, a deep dive into the latest big art world stories, the top shows and the key issues every week. And please subscribe to The Art Newspaper at theartnewspaper.com. We're on X, formerly known as Twitter, at Tan Audio, and on Facebook, Instagram and Threads. Production, editing and sound design on A Brush With are by David Clack and the producer is Lewis Jebb. Thanks also to Daniela Hathaway, a big thank you to Stephen Willits. See you next week. Bye for now. A Brush With is sponsored by Bloomberg Connects. Download Bloomberg Connects today and discover cultural institutions on demand.